you so much for joining us today. Let me first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the elders past and present. Um, it's a great pleasure today to have um, the um, expert on one of the biggest topics which could define Australia's future economic growth narrative in a zero emissions future in line with the Paris Agreement, um, how Australia continues to export energy, non-fossil energy, and how Australia can change its domestic applications to non-emitting um, sources of energy. Hydrogen is at the center. Often in the debate, um, it's uh, the tricky thing is to flesh out what is the hype of hydrogen and where do we see applications that are absolutely vital to bring us forward. Reforming steel, um, storage applications, long range transport, um, and the energy, renewable energy export into other parts of the world. If, for example, Germany wants to electrify um, or put onto 100% renewable, not only the domestic sector, but um, yeah, the building sector, the industrial sector, then it can't produce all that renewable energy within its borders. So it needs to import uh, some energy. How does it work? The hydrogen is, of course, one path, whether it comes in forms of ammonia or other ways. But that kind of, it's, hydrogen is absolutely vital, and yet, when you go through airports, you see a lot of advertisements from uh, the big fossil fuel companies, Exxon and Total, all talking about hydrogen. And there might be a little bit, of course, the motive of petrochemical industries lose their revenue streams and the logistics networks of petrochemical substances if everything is electrified. The efficiency of a private transport vehicle if it's purely electrified, can be 10 times higher than if you go via the hydrogen route. So there are some applications where it might not make sense, but I also heard that our eminent speaker might uh, enlighten us a little bit more about the round trip efficiency maybe of some of these applications and how hydrogen could be pervasive to a whole range of applications once it gets done. So I should um, stop talking here um, because we have the um, Australian expert uh, with us in the room. Sam Bruce is a manager in the CSIRO Futures um, Group, the strategic advisory arm of Australia's National Science Agency. You will all um, know their uh, hydrogen roadmap. Sam sits at the interface between research and industry. Um, he leverages the deep expertise of CSIRO. Prior to CSIRO, Sam worked at Ernst & Young, providing there the um, commercial and financial advice to private and public sector entities across a range of different industries. Um, and then uh, he worked as a senior investment analyst at Infrastructure Capital Group. Um, his, um, he has two legs, one is law, the other one is science. So he was um, admitted to the Supreme Court in 2003, 13 as a qualified lawyer, um, and he also has a science um, degree where he specialized in chemistry and applied mathematics. So join me in welcoming Sam Bruce. Thank you so much. That works. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll probably spend about sort of 20, 25 minutes just sort of going through uh, the methodology behind the, the roadmap. Um, and talk through some of our key, key findings um, as well. Um, and then just sort of open up the floor for, for question time um, as well. Um, so just to, to give you a bit of background, um, so I, I, I'm working a team called CSIRO Futures, um, which is the strategic advisory arm uh, of the organization of, of CSIRO. Um, and we basically, our remit is we are a, a, a traditional uh, management consulting, you know, people service firm and we, we help business and government develop technology and R&D strategy. Um, and really our differentiator in the market is that we play that translating role between, you know, our 5,000 um, CSIRO researchers, um, you know, and, and translate and leverage their insights uh, for our commercial and, and, and government clients. Um, so um, just a, yeah, as a little bit of background on me, um, yeah, as, as was mentioned, um, I, I've got a, a science degree and a law degree. Um, when I finished uni, I didn't want to be a lawyer and I didn't work, want to work in the lab. Um, so I went into consulting um, and 
uh, you know, managed to, to work my way back to CSIRO because I wanted to be a little bit closer to the science. Um, and so it's, it's been a great um, experience. And um, for any people in the audience, students, um, you know, still trying to carve out their way, I'm happy to, to talk, um, you know, about that as, as well. Um, you will have seen uh, over the last uh, few months um, quite a bit of activity, or quite a lot of activity um, in the hydrogen space. Um, August was, was sort of dubbed uh, Hydrogen Month, um, where um, these three reports were released. Um, so this one, um, Australia's uh, Future of Hydrogen for Australia's Future, um, was the, the, the report delivered to the COAG Energy Council, um, led by Dr. Alan Finkel, the Chief Scientist of Australia. Um, and did a fantastic job of sort of presenting the vision, you know, what is the hydrogen vision for Australia. Um, the ARENA um, Assel Allen report, um, Opportunities for, Australian, for Australia from Hydrogen Exports, was more about quantifying the economic opportunities associated with, with um, hydrogen export. Um, but our report, um, so we were engaged, um, you know, we, we saw, I guess, the range of activity um, that was, you know, doing a great job of, of promoting hydrogen as, as, a pretend, as, as, you know, the fuel of the future. Um, and we were engaged to do something that, that really sort of um, talked about how do you realise that opportunity. Um, and so the primary objective behind the, the, the hydrogen roadmap um, was to provide a blueprint for the development of an economically sustainable domestic and export hydrogen industry. Um, and it was really designed to sort of help coordinate investment um, between the sort of three key stakeholder groups um, being industry, government and, and the various research institutions. Um, why hydrogen? Um, I'm sure uh, many of you have probably, um, you know, seen uh, or these questions being answered before. Um, but for us, it's really about, you know, having a single, well, it's, it's about um, finding new ways to decarbonise both the energy and industrial sectors. Um, and for us, what's unique about it is you've just got a single molecule that can service multiple different applications. Um, and we think that's quite unique um, and, and definitely something that, um, should be valued as well. Um, so yeah, so this graphic here just sort of captures the different applications. Um, so, um, you know, use um, in the energy sector for energy storage and electricity generation, um, being able to combust clean hydrogen for the purposes of generating heat um, to service the transport market. Um, and then on the industrial side, you know, ultimately it's used as a feedstock um, for a number of different chemical processes. Um, you know, ammonia being a key one, um, yeah, and as was mentioned before, uh, things like iron ore reduction uh, as well. Um, and then there's a the big export opportunity in the middle. Um, the why Australia question, um, I think, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, obviously, it, it, hydrogen provides an opportunity to decarbonise a range of different sectors, as mentioned. Um, but there are certain things that are unique in the Australian context, which really lend favourably to, to, to use of hydrogen. Um, so it's things like liquid fuel security, um, so, as you know, Australia is heavily dependent on, on liquid fuel imports. Um, hydrogen presents an opportunity to displace liquid fuels uh, or potentially use them um, to, to produce synthetic fuels or, or synthetic biofuels um, and basically localise our fuel source. Um, you know, we've got quite a changing um, narrative or changing paradigm within our electricity sector. Um, and so with the increasing, the fast increasing proportion of, of variable renewable energy in our grid, um, hydrogen provides a, a new way to store energy or, and, and more suitable for, for longer term storage. Um, particularly on the east coast of Australia, we have, you know, natural gas uh, constraints or, or, or challenges in relation to, to use of natural gas and the cost of natural gas. Um, and hydrogen can play a role um, there as well. Um, but we also have a really skilled workforce um, and a skilled manufacturing base, which could be transitioned quite easily um, and, and upskilled to, to serve, you know, an emerging hydrogen market. Um, and then, of course, there's this huge opportunity for export, um, which I'll talk about a, a little bit more later. Um, the why now question is one that gets thrown around quite a bit. Um, and in reality, it's probably a confluence of, of, of different factors. Um, but one of the findings that came out pretty early um, in, in our analysis supporting the roadmap was that we're at a point now where the value chain, the hydrogen value chain is now underpinned by a series of mature technologies. Um, and many of you will have seen this technological readiness level scale and commercial readiness index scale, um, which we basically use to map the emergence of, of all different types of technologies. 
And what we found, um, according to this scale, is that the current state, we're at that high level, high TRL level. So things have been de-risked from a technical perspective, but we're at that low commercial readiness level. And so with that, the, the narrative now shifts from R&D development to market activation. So going from um, basically small scale trials and getting those economies of scale and getting to that bankable asset class. And we've seen a great precedent, um, you know, with the solar PV industry um, in the last couple of years, um, where now you can invest in a utility scale solar farm and get a positive return um, without any assistance from government. Um, solar had it a little bit easier in the sense that you were, you were developing a technology that could feed into an existing market. The challenge with hydrogen is that the supply and demand technologies um, basically have to mature at the same time. Um, so it makes things a little bit tricky and, and sort of requires a bit more strategic investment. So we wanted to, I guess, develop a report that really showed that hydrogen can be an economically sustainable industry, being that it's not something that has to be propped up by government for its entire life cycle. Um, so what underpins an economically sustainable industry is having both a supply and demand. Um, and so the way we went about this analysis was to basically um, understand um, the various applications for hydrogen, which I spoke about earlier. And through that process, really determine the price point that you would need to achieve for hydrogen in order to be competitive with other energy carriers, such as batteries or be competitive with natural gas, for example. So we then took that and worked our way back through the value chain to really understand where we're at currently in terms of the cost and the maturity of the underpinning technologies and infrastructure. And then a lot of our analysis was about how you go about pushing these technologies down the cost curve. Um, yeah, so you can get that supply and demand and, and have that economically sustainable industry. Um, just breaking stride for a second. Um, so I'll just quickly talk through, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this, but I'll just quickly talk through, um, you know, what we saw as the mature pathways for production and then also storage and transport as well. Um, so we considered um, both the fossil fuel derived hydrogen um, as, well as, the, um, as well as hydrogen production via electrolysis. Um, fossil fuel derived, I'm sure it'll ruffle a few feathers uh, in this audience. Um, but basically we saw it as we're talking about low emissions hydrogen, um, so, you know, we only consider fossil fuel derived hydrogen uh, with CCS, um, whether that's CCS or carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and utilisation. Um, and basically the mature technologies uh, include steam methane reforming um, and coal gasification. Um, steam methane reforming um, is the most widely used method of, of hydrogen production currently, um, but obviously um, has that, that CO2 component. Um, and then on the electrolysis side, um, you know, the mature pathway, um, it, it's quite a mature pathway as well. Um, but the mature technologies that we looked more, most closely at was, um, was PEM, um, as well as alkaline electrolysis. Um, in terms of um, actually storing um, and transporting hydrogen, um, we considered uh, basically three mature um, methods for, for storing and transporting hydrogen. Um, the, the narrative around this is that hydrogen in its uncompressed gaseous state has a really poor volumetric density. So this is basically an economics question um, where um, you need to improve the volumetric density or the amount of hydrogen that you can store in a tank of fit size in order to make projects worthwhile. Um, so you can see here uh, on the y-axis that compression, um, you know, compressing hydrogen uh, gets you so far. Um, but then, you know, if you want to sort of reach those higher volumetric densities, um, you're basically looking at liquefaction, so liquefying hydrogen, um, and then post that sort of venturing more into using other carrier molecules. Um, and ammonia is one that's been talked about quite a bit. Um, there is another mature pathway which takes toluene and hydrogenates it to produce methyl cyclohexane, um, but there wasn't much activity uh, going on in Australia uh, in relation to that. Having said that, it could well be the first um, demonstration, demonstration for, for hydrogen export um, from Brunei to, to Japan. Um, but also what this diagram shows is how that then aligns um, to the various transport methods. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously, um, you know, you've got being able to transport a gas in, in, in a pipeline, um, you know, you can truck it around, you can, um, you know, transport it by train. Um, but really, once you start talking about shipping for export, that's when you need those high um, volumetric densities 
Um, so that's when you're talking more about liquefaction um, and ammonia, just because you've got such long round trips and you need to pack as much hydrogen in as you possibly can per round trip to make the economics stack up. Um, so um, going back to our methodology, um, this slide kind of talks you through how we went about our analysis. So what we did was um, basically model the base case of the more mature technologies. Um, and through that process, I mean, these are just sort of standard financial models. Um, and through that process, we used these what's called tornado charts. And we varied the sensitivities of the key inputs to really understand what was driving the cost of hydrogen, the levelized cost of hydrogen at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, some continuous, the, the, uh, the same thing seemed to emerge um, from, from most of the technologies that we looked at, where the biggest um, drivers of cost uh, were things like energy input cost, um, the size of the plant, um, the capacity factor, so how much you utilise the asset and sort of pay back the capital costs, um, and then the efficiency of the plant as well. And so... Once we identified those material cost drivers, um, what we did was then identify the key investment priorities. Not all of these cost drivers are quantifiable, um, but basically um, the key investment priorities were um, sort of divided into, into four categories. So we looked at the commercial, so for the right business models, the commercial opportunities, the role of government in underwriting investment risk. Uh, we looked at the policy side, so um, using policy to address market failures, um, then on the regulatory side, we considered economic regulation, so um, enabling hydrogen to realise its full commercial value um, in different applications, um, as well as you know technical and environmental standards as well. Um, on the R D and D front, um, we looked at where we could get incremental improvements to existing technologies, which is largely about you know improving efficiencies. Um, but we also considered the next wave of disruption. Um, which was more about you know, the, the, the post-2030 opportunities for hydrogen. Um, and then the social license aspect, which is definitely something that um, you know, shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and it's really about normalising the risk um, of use of hydrogen. So getting drivers comfortable with driving fuel cell vehicles, for example. Um, and what we did was, was basically model what we saw as the best case that you could achieve by 2025. So this waterfall chart kind of represents the cumulative impact of all the investment priorities that we set out. Um, and it was really about um, going back to that, all right, how do we get to that market activation as opposed to just applying an arbitrary learning rate to see how the technologies mature over time. Um, and so from the analysis, I guess the, you know, the key messages to emerge were, you know, in light of the maturity of the industry, it's really about strategic investments on the part of the private and public sector um, that could see hydrogen become an economically sustainable industry. Um, the barriers to market activation stem from either a lack of infrastructure um, supporting use um, or the cost of hydrogen supply. However, development of an appropriate policy framework um, creates that market pool for hydrogen. Um, and then it's expected that you know, investment um, you know, in, in the value chain and value chain infrastructure will, will follow. Um, and ultimately, um, it's hard to capture a whole industry uh, on a single figure, um, but I'll just take a bit of time um, to talk through uh, what we've done here, um, depending on who you, you, you listen to speak about <laughs> this particular graphic, um, you'll get a different interpretation, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, but ultimately what we've done here is show hydrogen being commercially competitive um, in the different applications that, that we've set out. Um, and what we've shown here is that um, this blue line um, is basically how we see the cost of hydrogen coming down over time. So it really represents the cumulative impact um, of, of all the investment priorities that, that, that we set out. Um, we've only modelled electrolysis here um, because we see that um, the brown coal to hydrogen project um, in the Latrobe Valley um, is probably the most likely uh, thermochemical project for a number of reasons. Basically, it's having a, um, I guess, a coal reserve right next to a well-characterised carbon capture and storage reservoir. Um, and and uh, I guess the other thing with, with the um, coal gasification is that it has to be done at scale. So um, because you need to offset the capital cost of, of both the project um, and the storage reservoir in order to make it cost, cost competitive. Um, so basically it needs an export offtake um, in order to, to secure the necessary investment 
Um, but the indication that we've been given is that um, this project won't get to its commercial scale until after 2030. Um, so basically there's a real opportunity for electrolysis um, you know, with dedicated renewables um, or grid connections um, uh, to basically service the market in the meantime. Um, the applications above the line demonstrate where the um, barrier to market activation um, is more about a lack of infrastructure. So if you look at the transport, different transport opportunities that we've highlighted, um, being both the passenger market, trucks and buses, um, ultimately it's about um, having designated production lines, which bring down the capital costs um, of the vehicles, um, as well as the necessary refueling infrastructure. Um, the remote area power systems uh, opportunity, um, depending on which state you're in, is, is a real um, low hanging fruit in the sense that, um, you know, that there's not so much of an infrastructure barrier um, uh, and basically you're competing against diesel diesel transported long distances, um, you know, which, which has a, results in a high cost of electricity. Um, and so there's a real opportunity for hydrogen to kind of tap into that market um, quite early, quite early um, particularly in states like Western Australia, uh, where you've got a range of a number of different remote, um, remote communities as well as remote mining sites. And, and mining um, is, a, is, a, is a significant um, opportunity for hydrogen because you can secure multiple offtakes within a defined boundary. Um, you know, so you can service, you know, the heavy haulage, um, the stationary um, uh, electricity, uh, combustion for heat and as well, and, and as an industrial feedstock um, in certain instances. Um, and then as we move down the curve, um, you know, the industrial feedstocks opportunity, that's largely about displacing steam methane reforming. So getting electrolysis to the price point that you need, um, so you don't have to uh, use gas and reform gas anymore. Um, and then export, um, export's a bit of a circular argument because once you get an export opportunity, so this, this, this number was based on um, Japan's price targets and what we think you could get hydrogen to, um, the, the price you would need to get hydrogen to um, plus the storage and transport cost to then meet um, those, those price points set out in 2030 by the Japan strategy. Um, but basically once you've got an export opportunity, um, it's a complete game changer for the industry. Um, so it puts a lot of downward pressure on, on all value chain costs just because of the scale that you're dealing with. And then under the line, um, uh, the applications where um, basically it's unlikely that's that hydrogen is going to be commercially competitive. So if you look at the grid firming services um, in the sort of seconds to hourly storage market, um, hydrogen would have a very difficult time competing with batteries and pumped hydro energy storage, um, as well as gas turbines. Um, and then sort of in the longer term, um, so the, the sort of um, daily seasonal storage opportunities, um, basically hydrogen is just competing against natural gas um, in, in that instance. Um, residential heat. Um, it's unlikely that hydrogen um, is going to be commercially competitive with natural gas just because you know, you're pulling one thing, one product out of the ground, um, you know, and manufacturing uh, another. Um, uh, and basically it's sort of positioned around here just because, and this is about 100% displacement uh, of natural gas. Um, it's positioned closer to 2030 just because of the longer lead time that you need um, in order to roll over the appliances. Uh, or change the appliances, but there's definitely a precedent for that. Um, you know, we saw that in the 70s when we moved from town gas, which had quite a high concentration of hydrogen, um, to natural gas. So um, it's definitely not unprecedented. Um, and then there's the synthetic fuels uh, opportunity closer to 2030, um, and basically that's that's using a, you know renewable hydrogen and a waste stream of CO2 um, to produce um, synthetic fuels. Um, yeah, obviously there's a lot of work to be done. Um, before we get a clear signal um, that this, you know, could potentially be an opportunity when we, if we were stepping away from, from imported fuels. Um, but basically then the upshot of all that is um, we showed commercially competitive in the first instance because we wanted to show how hydrogen could become a, an economically sustainable industry on its own. But then once you factor in um, other fact or other things such as, um, you know, localization of relevant supply chains. So, you know, if a Siemens was to come in um, and build a plant um, in Australia and, and if they get to the scale that they need, potentially automate that process, obviously that will bring down the capital costs of electrolyzers significantly. Um, yeah, so industrializing and, and automating that process. 
Um, as I said, the establishment of an export industry um, is, is a complete game changer. Um, you know, puts significant downward pressure on the cost of renewables, for example, um, just because of the scale that, that you're rolling them out at. And then once you factor in other factors or factor in other things such as, um, you know, the environmental cost um, or carbon pricing risk even, so without the policy, you know, a lot of companies just factor in the risk of, of a carbon price, um, you know, into their models at the moment, or things like an energy supply risk. Um, basically what happens is this curve starts to move up, uh, sorry, starts to move down, all the applications start to move up. Um, and you basically see hydrogen being more competitive um, in, in each of those different applications. Um, I should also point out um, that, uh, you know, this, this diagram was, was basically designed um, to describe the potential applications that you could look at um, as the industry um, develops, but it's, you know, it's been by no means determinative. So, um, you know, a lot of it will depend um, on the existing infrastructure that you have in place as well, um, you know, as well as relevant policies and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, just there as, as a guide. Um, that's all I really have to say, um, but yeah, happy to, to take questions um, if you want. Thank you so much. We also have 35 viewers online. Uh, if you want to ask questions, just type them in the chat box and then we come to you. Uh, at a later point. Now, let's first have questions here in the floor. And please take a microphone, introduce you, yourself with your name and affiliation. Um, just here, and then second is there. Hi, um, my name's Jacqueline, I'm from DPC. Um, I've been working on a little bit of reading your report and putting together something for the group. And we had some questions, one of which was about the water requirement for electrolysis and whether or not you could use seawater or water from the desal plant or if it had to be pure drinking water? Yeah, um, no, good question. Um, so basically uh, you can use any water source, but depending on the quality of the water, it has to go through a purification step. So um, basically you need deionized water coming through the electrolyzers. Um, but when you look at the overall cost of the electrolysis process, um, water is not, not material. So even if you've got a, you're running a desal plant, um, yeah, the cost of water is still is still not a material cost driver. Um, but basically, as a, as a general rule, um, yeah, the more purification you need to do, um, you know, the higher the cost. But um, we we didn't do a study on on the um, we, we didn't include it didn't include a detailed analysis on the water uh, requirements. But um, Dr. Alan Finkel has done that. Um, and uh, basically, um, you know, the amount of water that you need um, to service a, an export industry um, doesn't even encroach on, you know, the amount of water that is needed to service the mining industry <laughs> at the moment, for example. So um, once you actually drill into the numbers, um, you get, and, and, you know, there's obviously that fear tactic because, you know, we are a dry country, um, but um, yeah, it's not as material from a cost or volume perspective as, as people think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, my name's Sue. I'm actually a campaigner down in Western Port um, because we really need to protect the ecosystem there. And even with the gas pipeline, there's a 30 metre clearance on a less volatile combustible gas than hydrogen is. And I understand there's different pipeline requirements, particularly when compressing hydrogen. Our biggest concern is the most logical export point from Gibbsland is out through Western Port now that we know that the, the Bunurong Land Council have been asked to um, comment on their cultural heritage in the area and pipelines are already being discussed um, and ammonia plants in Hastings. Now, you know, this was an area the state government promised was gonna be for, um, for, for more for holidays rather than industrializing that area. And because of the calmness of Western Port, it's a logical area, but we might have 60 meter clearances of land, which is in Ramsar, close to Ramsar listed areas, the impacts on the birds. And in these equations of carbon, which I know are important, I feel that the true ecosystem cost of our Victorian habitat and our Australian habitat isn't fully considered right at the beginning of these projects. And I'd like them to be and for you to comment on it, please. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot I can say there. Um, I mean, every single, 
project pipeline project would would I imagine um, you know an environmental impact study um, would be a key part of that process um, you know and, and there'd be a, you know a, a large effort involved in stakeholder engagement um, yeah I mean there's not much I, I, there's, there's a lot about as I said normalizing the risk of hydrogen um, and making sure that the clearance ways for the easements are commensurate with the level of risk um, I think that's an important point as well and getting the right standards uh, in place and, and having that that stakeholder engagement so people are aware of the risks um, but also recognize that um, you know it, it, whilst hydrogen is more volatile um, you know if you have the appropriate um, infrastructure in place um, you know it, it's safe um, so that's all I can really say there. I'm not involved in any sort of placement of, of um, assets or pipelines and, and things like that. Thanks for the presentation. My name is Tim Forsey. I'm the energy advisor. At home, I heat uh, our house with a reverse cycle air conditioner, which is a heat pump. We heat our water with a heat pump. Uh, we do that about the third of the cost of using gas. So what are the chances of hydrogen in the gas grid competing with uh, heat pumps for home heating? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think when, once you start talking about scale, so whether you go electrification everywhere or hydrogen everywhere, the studies that I've seen is, uh, show that hydrogen um, is a more cost effective way um, of decarbonizing um, that sector, largely because of the infrastructure requirements um, that you would have uh, on the electricity network if you went down the electrification pathway. Um, particularly around storage as well. You know, when you start talking about storing at scale, it's much cheaper to store energy as a gas than in batteries, uh, for example. So, um, you know, because you've got that in, you know, in the northern parts of Australia, it might not matter as much because the heating requirements are, it's great. Um, but, you know, but in the lower part of Australia where, you know, people still run their, <laughs> their heaters, um, you know, quite a bit during the winter months, um, having that variation um, in terms of demand profiles um, means that there'd still be a significant storage component. Um, and so um, that's why um, at the end of the day, hydrogen becomes a more cost-effective method of decarbonizing residential heat. I thought the answer was a simple zero, <laughs> zero chance uh, of competing against heat pumps. Um, now we have the next Question. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Natasha Sinclair. I'm a student here at Melbourne. Um, I'm interested in the assumptions about the speed of uptake um, that have been assumed in the numbers that you've uh, put forward uh, to create that graph there. I can see that um, it looks like within sort of three to four years, um, you're expecting to have um, a significant um, uptake of these technologies um, in, for instance, with pa passenger vehicles and trucks. So uh, can you just give us some, some thoughts on, on what assumptions were made there? Yeah, sure. I mean, our objective was to not, um, I guess, make assumptions on the rate of, of uptake. Um, you know, you can say that we, we don't put any dollar values on, on the sectors. Um, what we focused on doing was showing where hydrogen could become commercially competitive with other energy carriers in different applications. Um, in the first instance. Um, and then, so we'd say, you know, if you implement our investment priorities, then you can reach this price point. And then it's up for the market to decide. Um, I, I personally think that making assumptions around, um, you know, actual uptake of, of fuel cell vehicles, for example, is a very difficult <laughs> thing to do. Um, and often, um, you know, when you put a number in, people put a lot of weight on that um, without actually really investigating the assumptions that sit behind that. Um, and so, yeah, our objective was to show here's where we think, here's how we think we can get to that commercially competitive price point. And then it's up to the market to decide. So, you know, in the transport example for passenger vehicles, um, we see fuel cell vehicles as a complementary solution. Um, if you like driving uh, your car in the same way, uh, you know, if you want to drive an electric vehicle in the same way that you do um, an internal combustion engine, um, then a fuel cell vehicle uh, could be more applicable for your, for your driving taste. Um, and then obviously the sweet spot is in the heavy haulage space, so buses and trucks. Um, 
uh, yes, you know, the, the, the recharging uh, capabilities for batteries are improving, but, you know, if you're a logistics company running a series of, of trucks um, or, or, you know, a bus company, um, the amount of recharging that you would have to do um, would seriously impact your business model. Um, and so that's why, um, you know, hydrogen uh, definitely becomes a more applicable solution for that, that heavy vehicle market. I'm very interested in energy, I've been all my life. Um, the, are you aware, yes, you will be aware of that, of the Leeds project in the UK, yeah. where they have replaced and are in the process of replacing all of the pipelines in the city of Leeds, which is not a small city, uh, by PBC, which they have to do to build a parking improvement. Um, I, what I can't find on that project is, of course, any economics. Um, can you enlighten us perhaps on the economics of the Leeds project? And just a little sub question, can we get your slides? <laughs> yes, you can have the slides. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I guess we, we only have what's publicly available um, in relation to the Leeds project. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky um, because one of the things that the Leeds project talks about quite a bit um, and what we what really informed our analysis of the, the opportunity for hydrogen in residential heat um, was uh, the need to start um, producing standardized appliances because um, the, the biggest challenge is that that rollover that changeover of appliances um, so if you start um, you know if the government now was to legislate around um, you know only um, distributing standardized appliances then that actual changeover period um, becomes a lot cheaper um, and, and uh, more efficient because you just replace a standard backplate and connection with another one that, that's applicable for hydrogen. Um, so um, we, we know the changeover costs. Um, uh, I'd have to go back and, and get but the numbers in, in the report. Um, but basically, you probably need a government to absorb that changeover cost. Um, we're actually in a really sort of advantageous position compared to um, Leeds because we have the opportunity to put um, basically distributed electrolysis um, or into, straight into the distribution network. The challenge with Leeds is that they're looking more at a large steam methane reformer with a big CTS plant. And that means they have to go through the transmission network um, in order to, to um, so reach their customer base. Um, and we've got the, the opportunity to just go straight to the distribution network. And so the pipeline, because you're operating at a lower pressure, um, the pipeline requirements uh, are, are much more favorable. Um, and my understanding is that along the East Coast, we're rolling over to PVC um, anyway. So regardless of what happens, just because our pipeline infrastructure is so old. Um, so with that rollover happening anyway, depending on you know how you, do your financial engineering, <laughs> um, you know, you could sort of work out a, a you know, a, a reasonable solution potentially, but yeah, it's, it's uh, something to get down the track, I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, you will notice that with that topic, you get that onslaught of questions. And I think we have a backlog of probably an hour worth of questions, but <laughs> we still have 20 minutes time. So that's very good. We, let's first go to three online questions and then we can, uh, back here to the end. gentleman, Craig Burton, a student from university, by judging the email address, can you, no, that does not, yes, can you hear us, can you talk, Craig, can you hear me, your question, um, I keyed it in, but um, I can ask it again if you like, keep speaking, um, but, I just wanted to okay. ask, we, we try in a moment again, um, it's, Go here to the question and then the planning. You Okay, yep. Simon Coburn, mechanical engineer. Um, I've picked up on your term market activation. Been involved in my life transferring intellectual property from one part of the world to another and establishing a, an industrial chain to, to build something and provide a service. Have we done the top-down analysis as a country? If, if Japan has a stated need for hydrogen, on that time, have we compared ourselves with other, the cost base of other countries? Yeah. to assess our competitiveness in the way that we had the cheapest natural gas in the world before we exported it. Uh, are we in a position to be competitive against our, you know, uh, yeah, uh, to, to supply that 
yeah, sure. hydrogen Japan needs by the, by 2030? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so the uh, Arena Assel Allen report um, basically did that comparison um, between us and other um, uh, countries looking to export hydrogen, as well as what it would cost to produce hydrogen domestically within countries such as Japan and Korea. Um, and largely because of our solar resources, um, you know, we are extremely competitive. Um, but cost isn't the only thing. Um, so, you know, you, there are other factors to consider, such as, you know, sovereign risk, um, you know, um, existing trade relationships and agreements. So, you know, we've got existing um, trade agreements with countries like Japan, um, which are really important from a tariff perspective. Um, so um, we, we probably won't be the only uh, exporter of, of hydrogen, um, but we've, if we act, <laughs> um, and that's probably the, the biggest <laughs> caveat, um, if we act quickly, um, you know, there's a real opportunity to, to service that market. Um, so obviously there's the, the project um, in the Latrobe Valley, the, the HES project, which is the coal to hydrogen project. Um, you know, um, uh, but, you know, Western Australia, you know, Queensland, out of Gladstone, the Northern Territory, you know, they're probably the other sweet spots for, uh, for an export um, opportunity. Um, yeah, and uh, there's plenty to be learned from the LNG industry, as, as you said. So often that starts with, you know, a government to government offtake agreement, which gives industry the confidence it needs to start securing the investment. Because, I mean, they, the capital costs of, of these projects will be huge. Um, so, you know, getting that vertical integration, you know, establishing consortiums between Australian companies and Japanese and Korean companies, um, you know, all that stuff will follow once you get that clear direction from, from governments. So, um, yeah. Craig, second attempt. Yep. Can you hear me this time? Can you talk? Yep. I'm trying. Uh, can you hear me this time? Your question. Your microphone is unmuted. Yep. Um, yes, we can hear some sound. Uh, you can't hear me speak, right? Craig, Hello? can you ask your question? Yes. Um, how so does hydrogen with... compare to natural gas in terms of joules? So it's much more energetic. So you've just looked at the cost per kilogram, but really um, um, it's a much more energetic gas, so it must be more valuable as a heat source. Okay. Technology is not on our side today. Let's continue here with a question from Dylan. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for an interesting presentation. I had, this, I guess, a follow-up question similar to what uh, David was asking and um, uh, Tim earlier on about the, I guess, residential heat sector and the, the replacement of the infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure, um, uh, sorry, the pipeline infrastructure to uh, be interested to know your thoughts of like, there are potential costs with um, upgrading the electricity network to provide um, uh, just elect for electrification, but uh, yeah, how does that compare to the cost of re running redundant infrastructure, essentially, with both, you know, two sets of infrastructure to deliver the same service, um, and the cost of, you know, replacing, you know, however many billion dollars worth of uh, assets that are not uh, currently um, able to transport hydrogen? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of preface this by saying I, we haven't done a sort of detailed analysis. Um, there are other groups, so AGIG um, yeah, was engaged to do a, a more detailed analysis of the, the cost comparison between uh, electrification um, and, and using hydrogen. Um, yeah, what, what I do know is that it is more expensive to completely electrify your house um, than um, sort of re replace parts of appliances. Um, so I think if you, uh, AGIG, I think, I think you've released a report or uh, I think if you, if you look at the um, Energy Networks Australia website, um, you might be able to, to find something there. Um, there was also a KPMG study that was done um, a couple of years ago, um, but focusing on the UK, um, which is again a bit different just because the heating requirements are much, are much higher. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I can't go into too much detail there. Um, a lot of it depends on, on how you do it. So if you, as I said before, like if you get the right policy framework in place where, you know, you're dealing with standardized appliances, for example, um, that obviously reduces the capital cost or, or the changeover cost. Um, and if you get to that volume, you have those economies of scale and those appliances as well, you know, so then it's just 
you know, paying the same amount as you would for a standard natural gas um, appliance. So, yeah, sorry, I, I can't go into too much detail there. Frederick, can you hear us from EY? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll ask this question. Can you hear me? Potential scale of production in Victoria by 2030. Um, what potential demand from export markets? Is Japan serious about it? Other countries? Have you looked into the policies and made recommendations in your report? Are we talking about typical grant funding programs, identified policy specific to hydrogen value chain? Whole set of questions. Is that Frederick Papon? Yes. Okay. Is my first boss. <laughs> so I've got to answer this one properly. I was blinking light is probably Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, so I mean, I only remember a couple of those, of those points. <laughs> What's in Victoria? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the size of the potential scale of production in Victoria. Um, so I think the uh, colder hydrogen project uh, in the Latrobe Valley um, is looking at, um, I think it's 770 tonnes per day, I think, of, of production. So that's at for the commercial scale plant, which is, uh, which is quite big. Um, yeah, the potential demand for export markets. I, I was fortunate enough um, to visit both Japan and Korea um, this year. Um, I think for the Japan context, the jury is definitely still out uh, on nuclear, um, which will also impact um, you know, demand for, for hydrogen. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, there's just so much activity going on in relation to hydrogen and, you know, I was, went to visit a refueling station and you just stand there and, you know, these fuel cell vehicles come in, um, you know, refuel, uh, just like it's, it's business as usual. Um, yes, the cost is heavily, heavily subsidized, um, at this stage, but that's what's needed, you know, in order to, to get to those economies of scale, um, Korea, um, which is the other notable jurisdiction, um, have just a bit behind Japan, but have just come out um, with a strategy that is a little bit hard to, to access. Um, but you know, confirming their need for um, you know imported hydrogen, um, uh, particularly from Australia. Um, so, as I said before, being able to leverage um, you know existing trade agreements and, and things like that. Um, yeah, the policies. Um, we are at CSIRO. We are uh, somewhat limited in, in terms of being able to give advice. Um, in relation to policies, but um, particularly in relation to, to export. Um, as I said, you know, it, it's quite similar to, to the emergence of the LNG industry. And so having that, that sort of government to government agreement really gives um, industry the confidence um, it needs to, to start investing uh, in these types of projects. Um, grant programs, um, I think they're, they're probably, um, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about sort of earlier stage R&D, um, there's obviously the standard different grant programs. So ARENA, um, you know, has, has uh, like a $20 million uh, investment fund um, focused purely on hydrogen export projects. Um, uh, I can't comment on uh, other sort of tax concessions, but, um, you know, we're doing work with different governments now um, about identifying, um, you know, those first series of demonstration projects that you need to start moving up the CRI scale, um, you know, and that can be, um, you know, a financial investment. It can be help um, on the regulatory side. Um, yeah, so the whole different ways that you can go about stimulating uh, investment. Um, identify policy specific to the hydrogen value chain. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we're starting from a low base <laughs> um, when it comes to, to sort of uh, carbon uh, type policies. Um, but having said that, there will be, because hydrogen is a little bit behind other technology options, um, there will be some sort of more hydrogen specific um, policies needed. So, for instance, um, you know, on the transport side, so having, um, you know, an emission standard on vehicles, um, you know, that will sort of speed up the rate of, of uptake, but then you know, at, at the very least to have all the same concessions for electric vehicles or battery electric vehicles as you would for fuel cell vehicles um, is obviously really important as well. Hopefully I answered all those, uh, those questions. Yeah. This is the one chance you can talk to Frederick without him yeah, yeah, I know, without yelling at me, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, yes, gentlemen. 
Uh, thank you, Sam. That was great. Um, Glenn Drover from the Australian Institute of Energy. The cost curve slide, which was up there till just a few minutes no, ago, uh, it, it has a very significant cost reduction in only a couple of years. So you sort of get down to 50% in five years, but very rapid cost reduction in the first two years. Uh, the previous slide that had the individual wedges that make up that 50% cost reduction uh, weren't time-based. I just wondered, was there something in particular that yeah. creates that very significant drop in the first two years? Thank yeah, you. a lot of it. Um, so, so basically one of the biggest drivers of cost is scale. Um, so, um, and that's kind of why this line asymptotes out a little bit because we modelled um, our best case. So our base case was one megawatt electrolyzed electrolyzers, um, but our best case was 100 megawatt. Um, the reason why we capped it at 100 megawatts is because of the way in which electrolyzers scale. So once you get to um, 100 megawatts, you basically start getting a more incremental cost improvement by being able to reutilize, or sorry, even once you get to 50 megawatts, um, that's when your cost improvements from being able to reutilize balance of plant, for example, become more incremental. So the biggest drop is going from one to 50 megawatts. Um, but then it becomes a question, well, if you're not getting significant improvements um, in your capital costs, um, and you want to manage your risk portfolio, you're probably better off building another asset of the same size. Because um, if one goes down for whatever reason, um, you know, then you're in, in serious trouble. So um, that was the motivation behind. And, and that's largely what contributes to the asymptote. Um, I, I should also point out that we were somewhat conservative. So our best case assumes an electricity price of four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, you know, in reality, you might be able to get lower um, but you know with these sorts of reports it's better to undersell than, <laughs> than, than oversell um, but basically in the appendix of the report we clearly highlight the assumptions driving the base case and the best case and that's really designed to give a developer you know the opportunity to say All right, well if you think you can beat that then here's a more favourable cost of hydrogen at the end of the day um, so yeah I mean this, this also assumes quite a high capacity factor um, which, you know, if you're just focusing on dedicated renewables, which in the um, export context, um, dedicated renewables might not give you, probably won't give you as high a capacity factor, even if you're co-locating solar and wind. Um, but if you're talking about servicing an export market, you've got cost reductions, a number of different other cost reductions, um, you know, which can help your cause as well. So, I mean, we can't, we can't model every scenario, but we just want to be really transparent about the assumptions that we were, we were using. Yeah, Thursday, a week ago, Twiggy Forrest gave you $20 million. I was waiting for this question. <laughs> Why only $20 million? Why not uh, 100 of them? Um, I wasn't part of the <laughs> negotiation process there. Um, basically, the, the agreement is it's $20 million for um, basically the option, uh, the first right of refusal on all hydrogen technologies coming out of the CSIRO. Um, and then there's a portion of that that's um, focused on the um, ammonia membrane um, that we've been developing. Um, so I guess that's probably the reason why it was only $20 million. Um, it's more, uh, you know, $20 million for a right of refusal or an option. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Just on the, the question of electricity prices and capacity factors, um, did, did you consider a scenario or in your sensitivity, um, I guess, a low capacity factor, low electricity price scenario? Because in my mind, that seems like a, a potential use case with high penetration renewable energy systems. Yeah. Where you, you are, you, you are, I mean, we're already getting sort of negative prices in the middle of the day on occasion. Um, but yeah. Yeah, is that something you can speak yeah. to? Yeah, so we looked at three options. Um, we looked at a grid connected electrolysis scenario, um, dedicated renewables, as well as being just using surplus um, electricity. So obviously, you're talking there about zero pricing electricity or even negative. Um, what we found was that that scenario um, or that option is probably the worst because the capacity factor is so low. And so while the capital cost of electrolyzers is so high, um, then you run into to trouble there on a cost basis. Um, so basically the, um, the best case scenario is if you can position your electrolyzer where you can optimize between the three, uh, the three options. So 
which you know might or, you know fully accept that that might not always be possible. Um, but um, you know, being able to um, have a grid connection, you know, potentially at night when demand is low, so you can still run your electrolyzers and get that high get that high capacity factor. Um, but then during the day, use really low cost surplus um, renewable electricity um, as well. Robert, yes, Marty. It's you are on stage. Okay. Is there any potential for hydrogen powered community owned power systems? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's what we talk about when referring to remote area power systems. Um, you know, particularly uh, in places like Western Australia where they've got such a high electricity cost because they're transporting diesel um, such long distances. Um, and the WA government has definitely um, identified, uh, you know, remote area power systems as a really significant opportunity and, you know, an opportunity for, for the state to become a, a real market leader uh, in that space. Um, particularly if you've got a community adjacent to a mine site, um, you know, you can really start to ramp up the size of the um, hydrogen production um, asset, uh, you know, because you're servicing um, multiple applications. Um, and obviously that, you know, contributes significantly to lowering the cost of, of hydrogen produced. So, um, yeah, it's definitely one of the low hanging fruit. Thank you. It's uh, Joe Yunane from the Victorian Clean Tech Fund. Uh, just a question on the technologies you've selected and you've, I note that you've selected mature technologies, but there are emerging technologies transporting hydrogen, for instance, in methane, which is built on ammonia and can use the existing infrastructure. And I know CSIRO is arguably looking at some of these. Do you want to make a comment about emerging hydrogen technologies? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the report, we, we, we looked at a lot of the emerging technologies. Um, I guess the, the challenge is, you know, when you talk about the evolution of, you know, technologies that are sort of at that low TRL level, um, you know, it's unlikely that they will get to that commercial scale by 2030. Um, at least those, those real sort of disruptive technologies. Um, I think on the LNG, so synthetic, synthetic natural gas um, is definitely a great, uh, opportunity. Um, it's actually probably more mature uh, than, than, than people think. Um, you know, that reverse water gas shift reaction can, can be done. Um, um, but that's really about decarbonizing the LNG, se LNG sector, I think, rather than developing a hydrogen export industry. Um, at CSIRO, we are talking about uh, <laughs> even, you know, uh, uh, basically being able to leverage the existing LNG infrastructure. Um, produce synthetic natural gas, transport it to Japan, reform it, and then bring the CO2 back <laughs> to kind of, uh, you know, like, the, yeah, as I said, like, <laughs> you know, it's just not going to be um, yeah, here. Um, but I think with the, um, with the storage and transport options, um, you kind of got liquefaction on the one side, which is probably is a higher cost, um, but gives you high purity hydrogen at the end that you can feed into a, a fuel cell. Um, the other methods um, using carrier molecules are being able to leverage existing infrastructure. So that, that's the differentiator there um, versus liquefaction where you have to build all new special purpose infrastructure. So, um, yeah, there might be a role for all of them, <laughs> um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Thanks. James Small from Melbourne Water has another question. Do you want to unmute your microphone? No, you can talk. Okay. Um, what is the international experience with hydrogen? You went into some examples. Are there any countries currently using hydrogen, maybe apart from Korea and Japan? Yeah, so Germany, um, you know, is a, is a real market leader uh, there. Um, you know, you, you can drive a fuel cell vehicle across the Autobahn, um, you know, in Germany. Um, California uh, is off, has also moved quite ahead, uh, quite far ahead. Um, but Germany is up to sort of 50 refueling stations around the country. And what you get there is um, move from a um, sort of ad hoc model to a, the rollout of a, you know, standard reliable system. Um, and so, yeah, once you get to those 50 refueling stations, it's almost like business as usual. And that, that brings down the capital costs of the infrastructure um, significantly. Um, 
China um, is another one, and we know that when China gets involved, uh, you know, it's a potential game changer for the industry, as we saw with um, with solar. Um, but it's always a little bit harder to find out exactly what's what's happening. Um, Canada is one as well. Um, you know, so Ballard and Hydrogenics are two of the biggest industry um, players uh, in the hydrogen space, and they're both Canadian companies. So more from a manufacturing perspective than than use. Um, yeah, but it's, it seems like a lot of countries are <laughs> sort of getting on board. Um, you know, even in Germany, they, they, they have the first um, commercially operating hydrogen train, um, which was which started a couple of months ago. So um, we've definitely got a lot of work to do to, to catch up, um, but we've got this unbelievable comparative advantage that um, could serve us pretty well if we do decide to go down that path. Thank you so much. We have one final question and then give you the chance for some concluding remarks at the end if you want. <laughs> After this marathon of questions. Thanks. And also Germany has a, has a plane, the HY4, that, you know, Stuttgart, that they've just flown, which is not commercially operated. But yeah. <laughs> right, short question, one of the policy levers we've used to increase renewable electricity in the market has been to set a target, you know, a percentage, a proportion for renewable electricity. Is there anyone proposing to do that for hydrogen? Is the Australian government, in order to kick off this, establish what you've mentioned every time, which is scale, anyone suggesting we set a proportion between green and brown hydrogen? In the Australian market, um, probably not at that stage yet. I think um, <laughs> you know we, you can start talking about what's green, what's grey, what's blue hydrogen once you sort of get to um, that next phase. Um, at the moment, it's probably more about just producing hydrogen, um, you know, and demonstrating that in various applications. I guess, you know, there's all this activity that's happened overseas, but ultimately you still need to de-risk this sort of investment in an Australian context because we've got different labour conditions, you know, we've got you know, different environmental conditions, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, so the next step that I can see is really about getting a, um, a sort of a, a requisite amount of demonstration projects off the ground. And that is happening in South Australia. They've got a few... Um, Hopefully, Western Australia will have a few um, or a few announced, you know, um, by next year. Um, you know, uh, New South Wales, so Gemini has just announced a $15 million um, hydrogen uh, blending in the gas network um, project. Um, yeah, Gladstone as well. So um, a lot of announcements, but we need more sort of metal in the ground, I think. And then, you know, you can get to start talking about, you know, the guarantees of origin scheme. So maybe paying different amounts depending on where your hydrogen comes from, that, that sort of thing. It's probably sort of the next the next phase. So concluding remarks, if there are some <laughs> policy levers, some barriers that are most or the biggest obstacles for a hydrogen future in Australia, what might they be? What would you which walls would you tear down first? Yeah, I mean I, I think um, a lot of it is about education. I think just um, educating consumers, for instance, that Hydrogen, a fuel cell vehicle is actually an electric vehicle. You know, the number of people that, that I still speak to that, that don't know about the opportunities for hydrogen. And then, you know, you talk about transport and they say, oh, so you can bust it in a, in a vehicle. Um, you know, being able to demonstrate things like, you know, this is an electric vehicle. It's just got a different storage methodology or energy storage methodology. So I think, um, you know, Making it business as usual, making it sort of a, a common part of the narrative um, is, is probably really important. I, I think education is probably the, the biggest obstacle at the moment. Um, yeah, people just don't know <laughs> about, about hydrogen. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, if we can have a coordinated approach, and that was largely what the roadmap was about, it was about coordinating um, investment. So, you know, the more and more people that, that talk about, you know, the opportunities and for the different applications for hydrogen, um, you know, and spreading the word and moving away from the Hindenburg <laughs> disaster, you know, and, and sort of, you know, de-risking hydrogen from a consumer point of view, um, I think is probably the most important factor at, at this stage. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, join me again in thanking Sam Bruce for an incredibly rich seminar.